Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We're really happy today's uh, Thursday, our lunch and learn. We got a wonderful class today with Home Guard Home Inspections. Sam Chow, our senior uh, account rep, is here to share with us. Hi, Alexa. everyone. And we have a senior inspector as well. So we have, we're going to really get a, have a nice treat for you, really going over the home inspection, pitfalls, things to look out for, where we kind of need to add uh, some disclosure and disclaimers that sometimes a client might have to get an additional professional, like a mold specialist, a roofer, electrician, plumber, because the home, the home inspector can't always make such, uh, you know, make such determinations while doing a whole house. So let's focus and specialize uh, where we're at. Let's learn about the products that Home Guard Home Incorporated provides for us. Excellent stuff. I just used their uh, services yesterday and uh, had a good time. My client's very happy with the with the report. Um, anything else? Hey there. Yeah, I'd like to add that I also used them for my clients, and it was a probate attorney, and the probate attorney was extremely impressed. The reports are not only very simplified, they're very detailed, they're efficient, how they provide their service. You get it right away. That's one of the complaints that we get from you know, our industry is, you know, how long is this report going to take? Two, three days go by. These guys get them in in less than 24 hours. So I like to say a little bit about Sam. Sam is uh, a person that loves people. He loves meeting people. He loves working with people. He loves fishing. So he took some time off from fishing to be here with us. Um, he doesn't like mean people. So don't be mean. <laughs> so I just want to say he's here with his professional experts. I'm going to allow him the opportunity and that privilege to open that dialogue up with you. So stay tuned. For those of you that are not here, I'm going to enjoy the great meal that they have here. Come on, Kelvin, let's go have a sandwich. Thank you, Sylvia. And thank you, Kelvin. And my name is Sam Chow. And uh, today we have uh, Brent Cannon, which is the general manager as well for the San Diego office. And we have Chris Bennett from the Corona office. Awesome. Brent. I have him come up to the stage. Hello, everyone. The floor. Very nice to meet you guys. When, tell me when you're ready, if you want to say a few words, and then I'll get the uh, slide going. OK, awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the company. Also, I'll talk more about uh, home inspections, termite, roof. Uh, we also do sewer lateral. We also do uh, pool inspections. Um, my name is Brent Cannon. I've been with Home Guard for about 11 years. I've been inspecting, been a home inspector since 2006, so about 15, 16 years. Uh, Chris is with me. Chris is the general manager for Corona. He's been doing it about 20 plus. So got a lot of experience in the, uh, in the uh, home inspection. Termite inspection, we kind of, uh, you know, I got licensed when I became a manager. So termite uh, is not my expertise, but I am uh, learning a lot more about it. Termite, termite can really be tricky, um, you know, and I'm learning a lot, a lot more about that. Um, but as far as inspecting wise, you know, when you, when you get an inspector out there, you're going to have, you're going to have a home inspector, you're going to have a termite inspector, you're going to have a roof inspector. They're all three different individuals that uh, concentrate just on their profession, which is going to be home or termite. Um, but they're, they're still looking for the same thing. The only difference is the home inspector is, is, you know, he's testing your appliances, stuff like that. Uh, uh, air conditioning, plumbing, electrical, whereas your termite inspector is, he's just looking for wood damage, whether it's water damage, uh, termite. Um, but there's so much, there's so much more to wood damage than just termite. Um, beetles do a lot of damage to wood. There's, there's bees, there's ants. Uh, each, each one of those types of damage requires a different type of solution. So if we mistakenly identify uh, what we think is termite and it ends up being uh, beetles, the chemicals that we use to kill uh, termite will not kill uh, beetles. It requires a lot more type of chemicals. So again, it's very important for our inspectors to, to be able to identify uh, correctly what they're looking at. Um, All right, I'll bring you up okay. the slides. But awesome. yeah, that brought me up to a situation where we had a termite guy go up to our attic and then we found several dead mice up there oh and then the owner was like that's what that smell was uh, all right you know, that's a, that's a great subject <laughs> Kevin, because a lot of people don't realize almost every house is going to have mice and the, the thing is is that you want them either in your attic or your crawl space um yeah it's almost it's almost impossible to, to keep them out of your house um 
but that doesn't mean that you can't take measures to keep them out of your attic, um, keep them out of your crawl space, you know, your vent screens, make sure there's no holes and stuff like that in them. Uh, but that is one of the things that uh, home inspectors will, will identify with for mice dropping and stuff like that. Okay, I'm pulling up the PowerPoint one second. Okay. And should be ready to go. Hopefully you guys see the uh, screen and uh, we'll advance the forward. Perfect. Okay, so uh, inspectors qualification. Um, home inspectors, um, this doesn't mention. Okay, so home inspectors in the state of California, home inspectors do not have to be licensed. Termite inspectors, roof inspectors, they have to be licensed, at least in the state of California. Home inspectors, you can have anybody that takes a 10 minute course on, on home repairs and become a home inspector. Um, it's not very difficult. What we see a lot is uh, uh, retired general contractors or somebody that used to be a cement contractor. The work's just too hard for them. They're getting a little bit older. They want to try to be able to, uh, you know, take the pressure off their back. So they become home inspectors. Most companies don't require home inspectors to be certified, licensed, anything. They assume that because he's a general contractor, he knows what he's talking about. Not necessarily the case. I've trained plenty of general contractors that were worse to train than somebody that had zero experience because it was hard for me to break some of their habits. General contractors generally want to get in there and try to find what's damaged so they could try to generate business for themselves. Home inspectors can't make their repairs. So for them to get in there and find the damage, they instantly want to try to come up with a solution to how do I repair that? You don't want to you don't want to repair it because in the state of California, home inspectors are not allowed to make repairs. Termite and roof, because they're licensed, they can make repairs. So we have a crew that will either make the repairs for termite or for roof. Uh, some of our termite inspectors uh, also do repairs. But if it's a bigger job, say for instance, you have a uh, deck in the in the backyard and the deck's a twenty thousand uh, dollar repair, that's not going to be repaired by our uh, termite inspectors, we're going to subcontract that out um, just because they have the, the manpower to get it done. Um, home inspectors, like I say, home inspectors can't make repairs. So what you're going to see in our report is it's going to tell you either how to fix it or who to contact to fix, fix it. So in other words, let's say I go to test your air conditioning, turn on your thermostat, do what I'm supposed to do to get your air conditioning to turn on, and it never comes on. I have to recommend an HVAC contractor, which is a heating and air conditioning contractor, to come out and further evaluate your air conditioning because it didn't work. A home inspector is not allowed to get in there and try to figure out why your air conditioning is not working. He has to recommend an a, a HVAC contractor. Same thing if it was plumbing or um, electrical. If it was electrical, we would recommend an electrician. Um, so so, uh, so uh, home inspectors, they don't have to have any, any kind of license or certification, but HomeGuard requires a certification and we have to go through OSHI. And OSHI is a, a license that we obtain, but it, it also keeps us, um, it keeps us informed on anything that changes. So we have to keep up on continuous education. So we're constantly, uh, year by year, we're constantly uh, further educating ourselves in home inspections. Uh, termite inspections, uh, at termite inspectors through the state of California, they have to do that every three years anyway. So they're constantly getting renewed their license. Uh, scope of the inspection. Uh, so a home inspector, like I say, he's going in there and he is inspecting from the roof to the foundation. He is looking at your roof, your attic, your, your interior, your exterior, your electric, your plumbing. There's a lot for home inspectors to have to get in there and look. Termite inspectors, they're just looking for damaged wood, whether it's water damage uh, or termite or, or you know, bugs. Uh, so preparing for a complete inspection. When, when you call for an inspection, you're going to get a confirmation from uh, one of our customer service telling you, your, your appointment's been scheduled for this day, so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. Then it's going to also send out an email to you or to your customer that tells them how to prepare their house for a home inspection. Um, 
what most people don't realize is that we still have to inspect your garage. Well, when somebody's moving, everything goes into the garage. You get rid of the clutter, everything goes into the garage. There's nothing wrong with that if everything was in the center of the garage. What happens is people that people assume I'm going to leave the center open so the inspector can get through the garage. Well, all that does is that just leaves us the center of the garage. So we're just looking at, you know, nothing. You're looking at a, a cement slab. Whereas, you know, the termite inspector really needs to get to the perimeter of the interior of the garage because that's where your termites are going to come from. If you have subterranean termites, subterraneans come from the sub. They come from the ground. So if you have termites in your garage, they're going to come from the ground. The ones that are that that you see swarming sometimes, you see them up in the attic, you'll see wings. Those are dry wood termites or damp wood termites. Those are the ones that eat your wood. So they can live in the attic where subterraneans, they have to live in your soil. So two different types of termites. Uh, but again, they're still doing damage. So it has to be identified by you know, the termite inspector. Um, so being able to, to thoroughly get in there and inspect your home, you know, the garage needs to be cleared out. Uh, the dogs need to be put away. You know, we have some inspectors that are just horrified of dogs. <laughs> so they walk in, they see a poodle, that dog needs to be put away. <laughs> Pit bull, that dog needs to be put away. So they'll get that email, your customer will get the email, and it'll tell them, you know, exactly what to try to do to prepare their house. If you've lived in a house, like when I sold mine, you know, if you've been there for 20 years, you're not going to get rid of all the clutter. We we get that. There's times where we have to call a further inspection. I uh, did a house not too long ago, walked into uh, a lady's craft room, couldn't even get in the room, you know, between her sewing machine and all her crafts and stuff, couldn't even get in the room, opened the door and said, oh, okay. So I had to take a picture and let her know once everything is kind of moved out or towards the center of the room, we'll come back for free and, and look at that, that for room free? for free. We don't charge to come back and further inspect because 9.9 .9, out of 10 times, it's not your customer's fault. It's not our fault. It's definitely not your fault. So something like that, we come back for free. It's usually, if anything, it's more of an inconvenience, you know, because you're having to set up an appointment. Somebody's got to be there to let us in. So um, if you can avoid the further inspections, it just makes it easier for everybody. But again, there's times where you just can't avoid it. Can I ask you a question? Of course. So at one property that we had um, home inspector, we did not know that the attic access was through the pantry. And okay. what they did was they boarded it. So, so you weren't able to, to no, actually get in. No, and the in Okay. So who would have to unboard that? So that's a great question. Mm -hmm. It's going to be anybody but us. Okay. <laughs> because we're not allowed to get in there and like get a hammer and, right. and start, you know, try to open it because if we damage it or, or break the opening, yeah. now we're reliable for it. Right. So you can either have a handyman, a uh, general contractor. Sometimes we'll have agents that show up and they're like, hey, I just came from the gym and they're in their gym clothes. They'll get in there and start working on stuff. Yeah. You guys can do that. Yeah. We just can't. Yeah. yeah. So okay. if it's something simple like that, I've had exterior access to the crawl space that's on the outside. And it had some storage in front of it. We're not supposed to move storage, but it was a couple of paint cans. Sure, sure. Yeah, stuff like that we can, we can move, you know. You just have to be careful because if you're moving something and you break it, we're responsible. Right. And yeah. I think in our standpoint, with our agency, I think it's perfectly fine if they move paint cans and things like that. For but sure. I don't think we would recommend our agents to pull out a hammer and start doing some carpet work. Yeah. Because then that creates other, you know, issues. Yeah, it, it does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. We, we... We, like I say, we try to avoid the further inspections, but there's just sometimes where you can't. Sure, but for you to come out for free, yes. I guess I've heard of. Yeah, yep. Because like I say, it's nobody's fault. Yeah. Yep. I haven't mentioned it yesterday, but he said that the garage was full exactly like he said. Yes, yeah. And he, he did mention it. Yeah. He said, if you guys need us to come back, we'll come back. Yeah. And there's times where, um, you know, we always use the garage because it's a great example. There, that's where everything goes. But there's times as, as a home inspector, if we can get to your sub panel, your water heater, sometimes your furnace is in the garage, there's times where a home inspector may not call a further inspection because he was able to move around things and kind of get to everything. But if a termite inspector is not able to see 100% of that ground, he's going to call for further inspect because all it takes is one, one little pellet from a termite to be missed and you could have termites there. Now, Brent, there's also situations where you absolutely do not have access, period. Correct. Example, a home in Maywood, the access to get into the cross space on the bottom, 
the gas meter was right in front of the window of that opening. Yes. And it doesn't matter how tiny you are and yep. how ergonomically you can That's right. move yourself around. You ain't getting it. You're not getting yeah. it. Yeah. And even if you did, now you're taking the chances of squeezing between a gas meter. That gas meter's got a gas pipe that goes into your house, you know, and you're yeah. trying to squeeze through yeah. there. And it's happened before, you know. I've done a crawl space. There was duct work. I've tried to get underneath the duct work because the agent was like, please don't call for further inspection. I know it's tied in there. So I tried everything I could. And as I was going underneath the duct work, I got stuck. And I said, I will never do that again. I don't care oh how nice God. the agent asked me, you know, because I started to get freaked out. I didn't think I was going to be able to get out of there. Now but somebody's nice. going to, yeah, now somebody's going to, uh, I just kept going and it ended up disconnecting the duct and I had to turn around and oh put it back God. on there. Yeah, it was a pain. Yeah. <laughs> next time I would, <laughs> next time I would further inspect or lose weight. One of the two. <laughs> uh, uh, limited liability. We have uh, 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 errors in admission were 10 million. So, you know, we, we cover everything. We're good to go. Um, okay. So OSHI certified, um, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail about our OSHI. Um, you know, we have, we have, all of our inspectors have to be OSHI certified. And there's a certain list that we have to go by to be OSHI certified. So once we get certified, we still have standards of practice, code of ethic, ethics that we do. We have to live by their, their standards. And it's just a way of keeping track of, of everybody, making sure that we're all kind of on the same page. You don't have one guy that inspects one way and another guy that inspects another. Because you'll see that a lot where somebody will have a home inspection. And then after we do our home inspection, they'll come back and say, you know, I already had a home inspection done last month. And there's differences between your inspection and, and, and his. The, the, the reason is, is because you don't have to be certified. So this guy can call anything that he feels is right or wrong, and then this guy can do the same thing. Whereas a termite inspector, they're regulated through the state. So they have to call the exact same thing. If they don't, somebody's wrong. In a home inspection, it doesn't necessarily mean that somebody's wrong. It just means that that was somebody's opinion. You know, We've seen plenty of foundation cracks, and we know by, by the, the expertise of, of foundation uh, specialists that we have dealt with, we know the difference between a foundation crack and foundation movement, okay? Any foundation is gonna have a crack just like your driveway. If your cement is poured in a, in a certain temperature, they crack, it's gonna crack. That doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with that cement. If you see the same crack in your driveway as opposed to the foundation, the minute you mention that crack in the foundation, people freak out yeah. because your house is sitting on that foundation, even though it's the exact same crack that you have in your driveway. Typical cracks are typical cracks. You're going to have them. But again, it's it's our home inspectors that need to know the difference between a typical crack and a minor, major, or moderate crack. If you have a major crack, that means your house is probably still shifting. If it's a moderate crack, that means it's bigger than typical, but it could be 20 years old. You know, So it's up to the home inspector to be able to give you the right information. And if it's missed, we cover it. So if something gets missed because maybe the inspector just felt like it wasn't a huge deal and come to find out it was we're going to cover it and when you say cover it what exactly does that mean so let's say they called let's say they're underneath the house and they're and they're looking at what we see underneath your bathroom we see stains under bathroom uh, floors because if your toilet overflowed or if the kids are in the bathtub splashing whenever you get water on the floor if it's not if it's if it's not a uh, tile it's going to go through linoleum it's going to go through carpet it's going to stain your wood. So when we go underneath, we're going to see those stains. Well, it's up to us to be able to tell, is that stained or is it damaged? And let's say we don't have a prober on us because we know the termite inspector is right behind us. He's going to poke it. So let's say we called it stained and then the termite inspector calls it damaged. That's on us because we didn't poke it. We should have poked it instead of just looking at it, assuming that it's stained. We should have poked it and say, no, nope, it's a little bit soft. It's going to have to be it's going to have to be scraped out or that floor is going to have to be replaced. Got if it. we miss if Home Guard missed it, that's that's an expense on Home Guard. Got it. Thank because they missed it. That. You're welcome. Okay, OSHI members are, uh, so this is still all about um OSHI, a background check. Uh, Home Guard does a background check when they hire you, but so does OSHI. So yeah. Fallon's, you know, you can't have any of that stuff on your record. This because is all about us being car certified. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so car, car certified. That's California. It's 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 same as the background check. Ashi does that as well. And the reason is is because a lot of times we have inspectors that show up, and the agents will leave a combo. There's times where our inspectors are doing inspections with nobody there, no homeowner, no agent, no buyer. They're just doing the inspections. Well, if somebody's in my house, I want to make sure I got a background check on them. You know, I don't want some criminal in my house. I don't care how good of an inspector he is. And I don't care if he's a born again Christian. I want to know. <laughs> I'm a Christian, so. <laughs> so you can say that. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a couple of things that I'm allowed to make fun of. Yeah. And people don't realize it because of the color of my skin. My dad's from Oklahoma. So I'm allowed to cut up our rednecks. Got it. Oh, what part of Oklahoma are you from? So my dad's from Tulsa. Tulsa. Okay. Yeah, I've never been there. I've been to Broken Arrow. Oh, really? He says I need to go. Yeah, and you should go. <laughs> I should. My mom's from Chula Vista, so. Nice. And then I did my DNA, and I found out that I'm from Baja, California. So I don't even know. I'm just allowed to make fun of everybody. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Which I don't. Because <laughs> I'm a Christian. <laughs> okay. Uh, home inspections. <clears throat> What a lot of people don't realize is home inspection is a visual inspection, okay? If, if we see a stain on your wall, we're, or, or on your ceiling, we're gonna call that stain, but we're also gonna recommend that a termite inspector looks at that because a stain came from either water or if it's on the ceiling, uh, we've had a, a mouse trap where they weren't actually in the trap, but you can see all the activity around it. That stain was actually was mice pee. So it's up to us to be able to determine where's that stain coming from. I've seen another stain go up in the attic. Your furnace was up there. Well, when your air conditioning runs, your furnace builds up condensation. They never added a pipe for that condensation to drip outside. So it was just dripping on a platform. And eventually that water ran off the platform onto your ceiling. So, you know, we see a water stain. We're like, okay, it's a two-story house. So we know it's not coming from rain. And there's no bathroom above you. Where is that water coming from? So once we get up in the attic and seen the, the, the uh, furnace, we knew where the water was coming from. But if we didn't get up in the attic, or let's say you didn't have an attic access, like the one that was in the pantry, the termite inspector is going to recommend cutting that water stain open just to see if he can determine where that water is coming from or if there's anything beyond the, the drywall, if anything got damaged. Because if you got water stain, it's, it's possible that it damaged the wood and not just the uh, the drywall, okay? But again, as far as a home inspection, it's just a visual inspection. Um, safety hazards. I, I always like to use elect, uh, uh, the electrical section as far as safety hazards. If I have an outlet that's missing the outlet cover, that's a $2 outlet cover. We feel really stupid telling you that you have a missing outlet cover until a child goes over there and sticks a fork or a knife or something because there's no cover there. Now we don't feel stupid. Now we feel stupid for not telling you because that child probably just got hurt. He got shocked. So um, safety, as far as safety, like I say, I like to use um, electric as an example because even though that uh, outlet cover requires one screw to put that thing back on, Sometimes you're like, why don't you just put the outlet cover back on instead of putting in your report? Well, I may not have that outlet cover and we're not allowed to do that. But if the agent's standing right there and I see the outlet cover, I would ask the agent to do that just because of a safety issue. So when it comes to electric, we don't, we don't say, uh, you know what, that's not really that big of a deal. When it comes to electric, there's no minor or major. It's all major. Because you're, you know, you're talking sparks, you're talking shock, you're talking fire. You know? Whereas if you had like a drippy faucet, or a drippy drain, and the drain is dripping to the wood shelf underneath your sink. I mean, if we don't catch that, it's going to continue to damage that wood shelf. Okay, so then I have to come back and replace your wood shelf because I didn't catch it. But at least we know nobody's going to die because I didn't catch that drain. Whereas electric, like I say, there's no minor. It's all, it's all, it's all safety as far as electric. But again, that is that is why you you hire an inspector. You want to be able you want to be able to feel comfortable that what your inspector is telling you is either safety or it's not. Uh, significant defects that's like the foundation cracks that we were talking about. Um, 
when I talked about a typical cracks in your driveway. Well, let's say you have a tree and the roots are going underneath your driveway. And now those aren't just typical cracks. They're, they're bigger cracks or they're actually trip hazards. If, if that's the case, we're not just going to say you got cracks in your driveway. We're going to explain probably why those cracks are there. You know, if we're able to identify, you know, we see the roots and we see the roots going right to the edge of the driveway and then they go underneath the ground and we can't see them no more. But all of a sudden you got these big cracks in your driveway. We know where they're coming from, you know. Again, that's visual. So what we're going to say is the cracks in your driveway are probably coming from your roots. But until you pull up that cement or until you go to dig the ground a little bit to see where those roots are going, we don't know 100% that that, that is what's causing the, the damage. But again, we're going to try to let you know that's probably where they're coming from. Start there. You know? And then if you pull up that uh, driveway and there's no, no roots underneath there, now you want to figure out why is that cracking? You know, a lot of times back older houses, they just didn't put down support on your cement. So there's no chicken wire or gravel, stuff like that. So a lot of it is just the soil underneath got soft and things start to move. A lot of times when you have foundation cracks, that's the reason why. It's the soil. It's not really the, the, the house. What we see out here, um, <laughs> excuse me, Southern California, a lot of houses without gutters. I grew up in Northern California. Every house had gutters, you know, just because of the rain. You go up to Seattle. Every house is going to have gutters because of the rainfall. You just don't have that down here. But we do get rain. Last week was a perfect example. You know, when that rain falls off your roof, it's just going to fall right to the to the ground to where it's closest to where it falls, which is going to be where the foundation is. If you just keep continuously drop water in that area, it's like stucco. If you if you sit there with a water hose and you blast stucco for years, that stucco is going to become just putty. It's just going to be damaged from water. It's the same thing with your foundation or the soil around it. If you're continuously dropping water in that soil, that soil is just going to become soft. Well, that foundation, the soil is the base of that foundation. That foundation is just going to start to sink. Your whole house starts to lean a little bit. So it might take 20 or 30 years down here because of the rainfall that we get, but it's still something to point out. You know, you still want to let your, your clients know that's probably why you have some foundation cracks. It's the soil, it's not necessarily the house shifted. So a few things, like I say, that's up to the home inspector to be able to determine. That's why we're constantly going through education, just to make sure that we know exactly what we're talking about. We don't want to give you guys false information. How to prep your home, kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, so when you get the report, Okay. Uh, when you get the report, the, the, the first section, the, our, our reports are about 25, 20, 27 pages, something like that. Uh, they used to be about 15, 20 pages more. What we find is that a lot of informational, um, sometimes we'll throw just things that's informational for your client. It confuses them. It makes them feel like there's something wrong when there's really not. I used to work with a company that wanted me to take pictures of everything. I used to always get phone calls saying, hey, what's wrong with the, uh, what's wrong with the oven? Nothing. Why'd you take a picture of it? <laughs> My company wants me to. So it just got really confusing. And, it, and, and the reports were like, you know, 60 something pages. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants a 60 page report because then it just makes your client, it, it, your clients just think that there's more wrong with the house than there actually is. When they get the report, the first part of the report is what we call immediate action. That is uh, it's just, it's where we include all of our pictures. Um, what a lot of people don't realize is that we might have more than one picture. So say, for instance, if you have damaged rafters around your roof, let's say you have five damaged rafters from water. We're not going to take five pictures. We're going to take one picture, put it in your roof, or put it in the uh, report, but we might take some more pictures that come at the end of the report. Okay, a lot of people don't look at the pictures at the end of the report, or they don't even read the report. They look at the pictures. So if we say you had five damaged rafters, but it only showed a picture of one, then the crew shows up and they repair that picture. They didn't even know about the other four. That's why it's important for a termite because a termite inspector, if it's wood damage, he's gonna he's gonna identify every uh, rafter. And each rafter is going to have its own uh, identification, whether it's 1A, 1B, 1C. 
uh, home uh, termite inspectors. Section one is what we call damaged wood, whether it's water or termites. So if he has a section one, he's gonna he's gonna draw a diagram and he's gonna say you have uh, water damage to the rafter, and he's gonna put one A to where on that diagram. That way, if a crew shows up, they look at our diagram and they're like one A is right here at the left hand corner. Now, if they look at one B, they just continue and they find one B. So they have to identify every spot that's damaged. Whereas a home inspector would say, you have damaged rafters in various areas, refer to the termite report. Uh, roof, the, the, after you get past the pictures, then it breaks it down into sections. It starts from roof, goes to exterior, goes to uh, interior, plumbing. Each one of those uh, sections, each one of those uh, plumbing, uh, electric, it has its own section in the, in the, uh, in the report. If you look at the red writing, the red writing is what we already identified with the pictures. So when you see all the pictures, you're gonna see the same thing in the roof. You're gonna see a picture of the roof where it was cracked tiles or whatever. It's gonna come up in red. All the other stuff that's in black, number two, three, four, five, six, and seven, those are still uh, uh, defects that were identified, but they weren't what we call immediate action. A lot of times they're informational, um, but still need to be repaired. The ones that are red, those are those are the ones that we feel that need to be addressed, uh, you know, quicker than the ones in the black. The ones in the black, a lot of times, like I say, they're informational, but but there's still something that needs to be corrected. But again, it's going to be our inspectors that let you know that's not right, but it's not it's not a safety issue. You can move into the house and start repairing those on your own at your convenience. Whereas the red ones, we recommend those being you know repaired before you move in or or shortly after. Uh, laundry room, that is a picture where I was talking about with, like with the ladies craft work. We couldn't even get in the room. So um, the sub panel, we couldn't get to. If you see this rope hanging down, that's your attic access. So we couldn't get into the attic uh, either because of the storage. So again, that's a, that's a further inspection that we have to come back and, and further inspect. For this is probably going to be sub panel, uh, complete laundry room because you're going to have gas. You're going to have 240 back there. Um, attic, and most likely that door leads to your garage. We got to test that door as well. Attic, okay, broken trust in the attic. Attics are um, attics are hard for two reasons. If your attic is completely full of insulation, which ninety percent of them are, depending on the age of the house, we are not going to get up and walk through your attic if it's if it's insulated. And the reason is is because the only way we can walk through your attic is on these boards that are on the ceiling. When you're in the attic, they're on the, they're on the ground, but it's your ceiling that you're stepping on. Nobody wants us stepping through their ceilings. So if there's so much insulation that we can't see your boards, we're not gonna walk through your attic. And what our report will say, if somebody wants to go up there and lay plank boards down to where somebody can safely walk up there, we come back for free. So a lot of times your attic gets inspected through the access. What that means is we walk up the ladder and we try to identify as much as we can. So highly important that people uh, bring some boards, bring some boards back so we can get up there. And I'd say probably in the 11 years I've been with Home Guard, I've been in an attic probably three times. People just don't want to go up there and put boards. And what kind of boards are they doing? Doesn't matter. Any kind of board that you can lay up there. And the board is because of the insulation, is because it has fiberglass or something? No, because the boards are going to lay across the planks. Mm -hmm. So the so the board instead of us trying to find the wood, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and going like this and then missing that and going through the drywall, because between those two boards is just drywall yeah. and then your ceiling. So either our leg goes through the ceiling or our whole body goes through the ceiling and you know, hopefully we land on a bed or something. <laughs> <laughs> the boards that we recommend bringing up, the boards will go across those boards Five. so you can walk across yeah, them. Like yeah, usually what's the easiest is like uh, fence pickets because you can you can take one or two of those up there and lay them on. It usually it'll take two, just depends on if you're, you know, fat like me. It takes two boards to walk across. Uh, 
So it's, you know, it's, it, it's really easy because we could take those boards with us and walk up there. You don't necessarily have to go up there and do that yourself. If you provide the boards, we'll come back and, you know, walk them up there. And like I can say, we don't charge for that stuff. It's nobody's fault. Uh, but what we try to identify is stuff like this. These are broken truss. If a, a truss is when you're, when you have these metal plates, a truss means your roof was manufactured in a, in a, in a, in a factory. It wasn't built at this house, okay? If you don't see these metal plates, that means that, that, that your roof was built at the house. If your roof was built at, at the house, you can go in there and make repairs to any of the damaged rafters, any of that stuff. If it's a truss, it has to be repaired by a truss engineer. Ooh. And a lot of people don't realize that. They go up there and they try to re, you know, either replace that board or cut it and scissor it. If somebody goes up there and tries to make a repair, we have to recommend that an engineer comes back to make sure that that repair was done correctly. Because like I say, this was manufactured in a, in a factory. It's all precise. Everything, the boards are cut the same. The, the angles of them are all the same. It's, it's, it's really important that that is uh, inspected by, by an engineer. And you're also going to want to say, how did that happen? Somebody, somebody had to get up there and either jumped on your roof and broke these or Somebody was up there and they had something hanging, maybe, and something broke. But you definitely want to figure out, not just repair it, but why did that happen? Because a lot of times you can repair something, but if you don't know the source of the damage or, or how it happened or why it happened, you can make a repair and, and you know, a month later that, that damage is back there again, for sure. Um, that's just more storage in the garage. <laughs> I think they get the point. <laughs> Electric, okay. Um, th this right over here, uh, the wing nut. The wing nut is okay, which is the red cap on top of the wiring. The electric wire underneath it is not. Uh, see the white wire? going into the top that's a neutral wire your neutral wire is going into the main wire coming from the city so that's 240 wire um, the two wires that are coming into the top screw that's 110 and 110 that's how you get 220 okay right now you got the you got the neutral going into the live wire that totally defects your neutral system so neutral system the reason for your neutral and your ground is if those wires get wet, are overpowered, the neutral and the ground system is what trips off your breaker so you don't get shocked. When you have stuff like this, it may not necessarily shut off your breaker because it's not wired correctly, okay? Also, when you have two wires going into one screw, you have a hole. You have two wires going into one screw. When you tighten that screw down, one of those wires is gonna get good and snug. One of them is not. Loose wires like that, is how you get sparks. This right here, you probably won't get sparks because it's neutral going into live. There's no energy to the neutral, so it's not gonna create sparks, but we see live wires going into live wires. See it all the time. It's called double load. You can only have one wire going into one screw. These breakers, these breakers down here, they make a, a double lug breaker. So you could actually have two wires going into one breaker but it's a different type of screw. It's not one screw that you're tightening down. It's two different screws. It's got a plate on it. When you tighten it down, it tightens together. So if you had two screws in there, it's gonna tighten them together and they wouldn't overlap. So they do make stuff for this. It's just nine out of 10 times, people don't wanna to go to the Home Depot and, and buy a lug or a breaker. So they just do something that's- And that red part is called a lug nut? No, just a lug. Just a lug. Okay. Just a lug. Yep, it's called double lug or double tap. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, so old knob and tube wire. This house looks like it was probably built prior to 1960. There is nothing wrong with knob and tube wire. We see it all the time. The only problem with knob and tube wire is it's not protected. This white wire, this is what's called a Romex wire. That's that's the only type of wire that we use now, uh, probably from 1975, 78. 
Romex wire was all that they used. Romex wire, if you look right at the end of this white, where the wires are coming out, it's actually protected three times. It's protected by the white vinyl on the outside. Each wire inside that vinyl is protected by vinyl. So that wire is protected. And then there's also insulation on the inside of the Romex, which is paper and insulation that's also protected. So it's protected three times. Knob and tube wire is protected once. Knob and tube wire, see that white, that white tube, the wire comes out of it. That wire has like a, uh, it's almost like a canvas coating. Over time, that stuff just gets brittle and it starts to just break away. Once that, that canvas breaks away, live wire. So it's only protected once. If we're looking at your wire, there's nothing wrong with knob or tube. We're just going to recommend that you upgrade it because of how unsafe it could be. Not that it is, just on how safe it could be. Okay. But the way that they tapped the new uh, Romex into the old uh, uh, knob and tube is wrong. You can't just tap right into it like that. So, and you know, you got live wire that's tapped improperly. And then you have no insulation in your attic. So all that live wire is just sitting right on wood. So again, it's protected by that wing nut, you know, but again, you could have a, a mouse up there starting to eat your wire. Now you have, you know, live wire. Mice don't, mice will be, the reason why mice go in your attic is because they smell. They smell the insulation. They eat the insulation because it has a smell, has a flavor to it. They don't know that insulation, they can't digest it. Insulation is going to kill them, just like the wire. That vinyl protection has some kind of taste to it, and they'll start eating it until they get to the live wire. Zap, you know, then it kills them. But now you've got this live wire in your attic, thanks to the mouse. So you go up there and you're like, well, I got dead mouse. Get rid of the mouse, but you can see the electric. That's why you hire us. <laughs> Again, no minor. There, you, there may not ever. Something may not ever happen in this situation, but it's up to us to let you know if this was my house, I would fix the wiring, bring it up to code, make sure that it's done properly, and I would put some type of insulation around it, for sure. More storage. <laughs> so storage under the sink. If we call storage in your garage, nobody's gonna be able to clear out your garage in the time that it takes us to do your home inspection. If I see the storage under the sink, I'm going to ask the agent, you want to get you want to you want to move that storage so we can further inspect? If not, then I have to come back to further inspect because I'm not allowed to move your stuff. So that would probably take your client or your you know or your agent five minutes to clear that for you. If they don't want to do it, we have to call a further inspection. And now we have to start another appointment, Inconvenient you, inconvenient the homeowner if somebody's living there, and obviously they do because their storage is still under the sink. Can I make a comment on that? Of course. So if that's something so simple and you have an agent that absolutely does not want to move it, which is irrational, Very. and then if you have the homeowner that doesn't feel like moving it, how is that third your company it's not. to nope. come back? It's not, but if, we do it anyway. Well, yeah, I don't want to say... Uh, because I'm in a room full of agents. <laughs> you really have to be careful because agents, if they're just not in the mood, you know, if they're dressed nice or whatever, like, I'm not going to move that for you. Okay, then we'll just call for a further inspect. I mean, it is what it is. I'm not going to force somebody to do it. But it, it usually it's, you know, it's the laid back guy that shows up, you know, in his gym clothes. And, you know, they're the first ones to be like, hey, if I move that stuff, can you, will you not call a further inspection? Perfect. Yeah. That's something we can talk about in our next sales meeting. Yeah. Should... And again, it all depends on the situation. Yeah. I'm not going to ask somebody to go and clear out the garage because number one, that's a lot of work. And number two, they're not going to have that done by the time we're done with our inspection. Right. And we're not going to sit there and wait because we right. probably have another inspection it's to get to. So, yeah. But something so simple like that, or like like the, the paint cans that I was talking about. Right. That's a true story. That's a right. real story. One of my inspectors called further inspect because he couldn't get the crawl space because of storage. And when I seen the picture, it was two five gallon uh, paint cans. Wow. Don't think he didn't get a phone call. Because <laughs> yeah. now I had to set everything up. And, and what's funny is I did the further inspection. So when I got there, the guy was like, 
did you really call further inspection for those two paint cans? And I'm like, I did not, but my employee did. I apologize. Yeah, he was pissed, and I don't blame him. And especially, you know, a lot of times you can ask somebody, it, it, you know, if, if there are inspectors in a hurry and he doesn't ask somebody, that's on him. That's right. on our inspector. Right. You know, we're all pressed for time. It, you know, we get it, but. If you're going to be five minutes late to your next inspection, we call scheduling. Hey, let the agent know I'm going to be five minutes late. The agent's not going to care if you're five minutes late, as opposed to I have to come back to a further inspect because I didn't want to move paint cans. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty hard for me to explain that when you guys call me and you see the picture and I'm like, I know. Yeah. I'm sorry. Other than the other than me saying that he's just lazy, there, there really is no excuse. I really hope that's not electric. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do your own wiring under the sink. You always have an outlet under your sink. That's where your garbage disposal is going to get you plugged in. And that's just an older house. We don't have garbage disposal. Okay, so a, a junction box underneath your kitchen sink, not a problem. Do you see that? There's no cover on the junction box. So they plugged into the plug. The plug is loose, right there's the screw. <laughs> so the plug is falling out and then they just taped everything. Will that cause a fire? Definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, the duct tape, is that electrical tape? No. Is it flammable? Probably, okay. Anytime, like I say, anytime when you're messing with electric, I'm gonna say that tape is flammable, Water's going to drip into that stuff. That screw is loose, so that outlet is probably going to fall over. I'm going to tell your client worst case scenario because I want that fixed. You know, when I tell people you have 10 pictures, you have 10 things wrong with your house. Nine of them can be fixed at your convenience. Fix that before you even move in, especially if you have, you know, small kids that are at that level. You know, we or don't want to. Even pets. Even pets. Even pets, yeah. for sure. We don't ever want to say that that we do inspections differently, but I'll be the first one to tell you, if I see a crack in, in, the, in the walkway and I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, that's borderline. Should I call it? Because I walked by it five times. The agent walked by it. None of us tripped over it. Should I call it? And then all of a sudden I see the buyers get out of their car and they got their mom with them and she's in a, in a crawler. You better call that for sure. So I don't, like I say, I don't ever want to say that that we inspect houses different because we're going to inspect our house the same way for your, whether it's a buyer or a seller, but there's times where you're going to stop and think and you're going to be like, you know what, I'm going to call that. It's the same thing with that. If it's electric, but it's, it's up here, you know, I'm going to tell you, you know what, that's it. something like that. I'm going to tell you to fix anyway, but if it's just an outlet, maybe it's missing an outlet cover. Somebody to get shocked in an outlet way up there. As opposed to an outlet down here, I'm going to tell you that's a 10 out of a 10 safety. That's probably a five. You know, I would never tell you that number wise. I'm just saying that as an example. But again, there is time where the agents get, um, the inspector is going to tell you, you know, the, the importance of repairs, even though the report's not going to be different. Inaccessible crawl space. That's almost as bad as the two cans of paint because it's one, two, three, four, five boxes. Yeah, like I say, we're not supposed to move stuff, but it depends on, you know, if there was a someone's artwork or a thousand dollar vase sitting in front of the crawl space, I'm not even gonna touch it. I'm not walking towards that vase. I'd be like, does somebody wanna move that vase? But if it's some boxes, I'd be like, you guys mind if I move those boxes? Or do you guys wanna move those boxes? And stuff like that. Nice. Yeah. It is because again, you don't want the further inspections. Horizontal cracks. A lot of people think horizontal cracks aren't a big deal. Cracks are cracks. Okay. You want to be able to determine are those cracks recent and why are those cracks there? What caused those cracks? Usually, when you have horizontal cracks, they're two, they're one of they're one of two things. Your concrete has rebar in it. The rebar is too close to the cement. And over time, the moisture from the cement starts to rust the rebar. The rust will cause horizontal cracks. Over time, you'll see the horizontal cracks 
right back here where there's almost a hole where the horizontal cracks start to chip away, you'll see the pipe or the rebar. Once you see the rebar, you're like, okay, now, now you have a rebar that's exposed. Once it's exposed, it'll just continuously damage, uh, cause more crack and get worse because of the rust. Those can be patched. All you're doing is just patching cement to, to try to prevent more moisture to the rebar, okay? That's if you're determined that's from the rebar. If you don't see rebar, those cracks are probably coming from the soil on the outside. A lot of time it's the soil that's pushing so hard, they cause cracks. So it's up to the, uh, you know, if we go outside and let's say your house is just as level as your sidewalk right here, and you have a sidewalk or a walkway or something, well, we know there's nothing pushing on that foundation, okay? But if you got this big hill over here or you got a foundation wall, and there was a hill on the other side of it. Maybe that foundation wall was built after they seen the cracks. So they removed a part of that hill, built a foundation, took the pressure off your... Uh... But again, once you see that, once you see cracks like that, we're going to recommend a foundation specialist. We're going to recommend either a civil engineer or a foundation specialist because he's the one that's going to determine is it rebar or is it pressure from the exterior. Right. Is that um, a structural engineer as well? Yes. Yep. So civil engineer as well? Structural, Structural okay. uh, soil engineer. Okay. Yep. When, when you see horizontal cracks, I'm sorry, vertical cracks, vertical cracks come from either the way it was poured or from movement. It's either movement from your house or movement in your soil. Up north where I did a lot of my uh, 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 training, a lot of my houses were in Hayward. Hayward has that, the, the, the uh, all right. thank you. Yeah, so we see cracks in almost every house if it's a crawl space, uh, so many in, in, in the Hayward area, and it's because of earthquakes. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean there's anything wrong with your house. That just means your house shifted at one time during an earthquake. You know, Northern California, you really have to, uh, you really have to keep an eye on certain things like that because they get, you know, they get a lot more, uh, Earthquakes than, you know, say Louisiana. You know, uh, our OSHI certification, it allows us to be home inspectors nationwide. OSHI is a nation, uh, is a nation certification. So when we're doing our education, we could be doing, we could be doing uh, uh, training on weight of a roof because of snow. I'm never going to see snow here, but OSHI doesn't know that I'm an inspector in Southern California instead of uh, Montana. You know, so we still have to keep up on that stuff, even though we may not ever use it, like math. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is under, I think, this is your tub. So the drain from your tub came disconnected. We go underneath your house, and you have a leak underneath that. That's where it's coming from, okay? When we go into your house, if you have a this could smell just because of the hair and stuff that comes in your drain. Anything that goes in a drain could start to smell over time, even if it's not sewer because of hair, dirt. Um, you know, I just had to repair my kitchen drain. The smell was so bad. But, you know, I just bought my condo about three years ago. I probably repaired somebody's clog from, you know, 20 years ago. But the smell was so bad just from, from the garbage disposal. You know, most people don't realize garbage disposal, worst invention ever made. <laughs> because people assume that they can throw anything in their sink. Mm -hmm. Ask my kids. <laughs> a couple of sunflower seeds in the sink, you know, and the garbage disposal is only going to chew up so much. What and then once you throw it down the drain, that all that, that junk is going in your drain. It's, it's going to be in your pipe over time. So this came disconnected. If we open up your crawl space and first thing we smell is sewer, we're going to recommend somebody get underneath there because you probably have a sewer leak, which is coming from your toilet. This is different because it's not actual sewer water, but it is dirty water. You can still get hepatitis C from dirty water. Um, and, and, it, and it's such an easy fix. It's just the, the pipe just came loose, just fell down. But if they wouldn't have had us come out to inspect it, it would have just continued. Just, just, I mean, it was a lake underneath there. Make sure we got all that. Home detection recap. Yeah, uh, what you have to realize is you have to t let people know that their home inspection is a visual inspection. People will always want me to say, hey, can you put that in your report? What's wrong with it? 
well, nothing now, but in a year or two, it's going to do this. <laughs> I'm not Nostradamus. I can't predict the future. I can't put stuff in my report, even though my opinion might say, you're, you're, you're right. I know exactly what that's going to do, but I can't say for sure that in a year from now, that's that's what's going to happen. Or we so have, or we have home inspectors plans. cannot put that in your report. They can't say that hill over there, if you don't build a retaining wall on the side of your house, that hill is going to end up in your front yard. It probably will. You know, just depends on how much rain you get. It depends on the angle of that hill, you know. But again, we would never put that in our report because visually, at the time of the inspection, there's nothing wrong with that hill. That is it. So I know I probably touched more. Um, I didn't realize I was doing more of a home inspection. <laughs> um, but if you guys, you know, if you guys want us to come back and do a termite, you know, let Sammy know. We'll come back and just just talk about termite and you know, uh, termite could be termite could be uh, you know the conversation on that can get really tricky because you're talking repairs. You know, uh, you're talking uh, you have to have you have to have authorization. You know, if, you, if you're if you're making repairs on a home that's 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 occupied. You have to have you know authorization from the homeowners. Um, there's a lot when it comes to termite. Uh, you know, and like I say, that'll that'll be another 20 minute conversation. So, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Any questions? Any questions? No. That was intense. Thank you. So much. It was intense. You're a great speaker. Thank you for joining us. For those of you at at home, any questions from the group? All right, well, thanks, Michelle, Laura, Jean, for joining us. Appreciate it, buddy. Okay, thank you. Guys. Um, I have that problem in my home. I didn't know that I had a problem, but I'm very 